Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where once a week we get together and explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our everyday lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelanek, and this week we're going to be talking about your weather equation, or equations. Now, as you can probably hear, my voice is on the the edge of collapse. Uh, we've been through this before a couple times when I've had a little bit of cold or been getting over a cold. This one's a little different, though. I, I think I may have picked up the flu. It was really disappointing. I saw that the flu vaccine, not vaccine, flu shot was only, I don't know, 10% effective in Australia this year. And that's usually a precursor for what we might see here in North America. Of course, I got the shot this year, which I don't always do. And so now I'm wondering if I got me a little bit of the flu. But... You don't need to hear about that. But before I dive in too deep, there's one thing I need you to do today. One thing. All right? I need you to go to whatisitaboutTheweather.com slash survey. Again, whatisitaboutTheweather.com slash survey. One last time. WhatisitaboutTheweather.com slash survey. And I don't care if you're on a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a server, a web TV. Do they still have those? I don't know. Whatever device you're using to connect to the internet, I need you to go take a brief survey. It'll take you roughly a minute. Now, the focus is for my folks here in the U.S., right? But international people, I'd love you to take it too because I'd also like your take on these same questions. Some of them won't be relevant. You don't have to answer the ones about Weather Ready Nation because we're going to talk about that in a second and that's what this is about. But this is going to help me in preparation for my American Meteorological Society session, which I told you about. I also have the benefit of all these other weather podcasts around are going to help me out as well. So thank you to them. And hopefully when my voice is back next week, I can at least give them a little more credit. But I want to try to give you what I've got in my voice. And like I said, we'll probably keep it short because I don't know how long my voice is going to hold out. I don't want you to have to listen to this version of my voice. I think it's a little bit nauseating myself. So we'll try to keep it brief this week. Now, I mentioned the survey. Did I mention the survey? What is it about the weather.com slash survey? Please do that. All right. It's winter. Do you know it's winter? You may not know it's winter where you are. Well, and certainly if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's summer. It's summer. Did you know it's summer? Now, I've told you before about how us meteorologists don't use the old school methods of the phases of the moon and the sun and all of our positioning and whatnot. We use the months that tend to capture best the different seasons. And for winter, December, January, February are those months. But I didn't even have to look at the clock today or the calendar or anything where that December 1st came up because I got my, oddly enough, Weather Ready Nation winter safety tips email. And I will put a link in the show notes. But it's that season, folks. If, if you're in a region that deals with anything related to winter weather, and that can be simple things like freeze warnings, you know, where things might get frozen that, you know, if you're in an area that doesn't get a lot of hard freezes or something like that, you might need to do some protection. Or if you live in an area where there are blizzards every year, take some time to go look at their recommendations. I One of the things I like about the Weather Ready Nation site and why I'm very comfortable being a Weather Ready Nation ambassador is they put something there for everybody, whether it's the weather novice or even the weather noob, but also us more engaged meteorologists. So there's a little bit of information for all. And so I de- definitely recommend it. Link will be in the show notes. Go take a look at that. Now, as I mentioned, weather has me. I don't know if it's the flu. I don't know what it is. But between my clogged head and my foggy head and what this has done to my voice, we're going to push through here with a I think it's going to be a little shorter, but I do want to kind of still hit what this week's topic is. And don't let it be said, come rain, nor sleet, nor snow, nor being under the weather. Yes, I will deliver a podcast. As long as I'm alive, you will get a podcast, at least to the best of my ability. I can imagine some situations that could keep that from happening. But me being a little under the weather is not going to be one of them. So today I wanted to talk with you about what does your weather equation look like? Now, I'm not necessarily talking like, you know, I might have one that says, maybe it's all even little emojis, little little rain emoji, little thunder lightning emoji equals smiley face. And other people, that may be, you know, uh, an unhappy face. You may prefer to not ever, it may just be blue sky equals happy face. 
and we each have different reasons for that, right? How we choose to respond or connect to weather is different for each one of us. But I really wanted to focus in on the part of weather that makes us act. So the, the equation, if you will, that makes you respond to weather. And, and again, like I said, now that last one I gave you for me, rain, thunderstorms, that might equal plus camera equals emoji. So, But that may make me act. Those two things together may say, okay, if, if feasible, I want to go somewhere and try to take some pictures. Not always feasible, but that's my general equation. That, that's what triggers in my mind, if at all possible. But it's going to be different. And there's certain actions we take with weather in general, right? Something simple, like an umbrella. So let's say you go to work every day and you drive. You may have an umbrella in your car that's just always there. But maybe if you take mass transit and you have to carry one in a backpack, Maybe you don't always have one with you. Maybe you have to think about it. So what is it that makes you put it in your backpack, let's say? What is that final step that puts you over the edge? Now, for rudimentary weather, the the cost versus the potential loss usually isn't that big. Now, I realize if you've got a nice new suit on and, you know, suede shoes, that a little bit of rain could be a a problematic thing versus just, you know, run-of-the-mill day. But we have to look at these things and understand these relationships if we want to try to respond in logical, all right, not emotionally driven responses. Okay, we, we want it in life, right? Do you find, well, maybe not everybody does. Usually we find that we tend to make more sound judgments, more well thought out judgments if we're not doing it from the seat of our pants, or off the cuff, or whatever phrase you want to use. So how do you get there? What do your equations look like? And I'm going to put forward that maybe it's really not an equation that you should be thinking about, but maybe, just maybe, you should be thinking about some sort of grid. I hate to use the word matrix because that throws people off. But before we do that, I, I want to talk just fundamentally why it makes sense to do these things. Now, when I was first getting into meteorology, Somebody sent me a nice gift. It's called, it's a book called The Economic Value of Weather and Climate Forecast. Got it right here. You hear that? I'm actually tapping on a physical book. And it was put together by, it actually says edited. So it doesn't say written, but it says edited by Richard Katz and Alan Murphy. But these are also two people that have been very involved in different aspects of weather. But it this book is focused on the statistical perception, right? As you can imagine, we're looking at these equations and what's the economic impact. Now, what I found interesting is this book was originally published in 1997, so 20 years ago, and a paperback version came out a little over 10 years ago, but it's still actively sold. And usually that's a good sign of a book. Hasn't even had to be revised. Well, as with all books, maybe they've wanted to. It's not always easy to do that, but a good enough book to where it's still actively sold. You're not having to go out and just look for used copies. You can find new copies today. And there'll be a link in the show notes if you want to do that. But one of the things I like that they do is they give you a very basic cost model to consider. Just a very simple little box, if you will. So, to act or not act, and did the weather event happen or did the weather event not happen? All right? So, as you can imagine, if you act... There's a cost associated with that, and that's going to be different for each one of us. Cost might be time, might be actual dollars, whatever it is. So if you act, there's a cost. If you don't act, but there's still a weather event, there's a loss associated with that. And the whole idea is finding the right balance that works for you, right? And that can get tricky. And and again, while this grid's a little simple grid, nothing in life ever works that way, right? So I usually recommend to people, when I have a conversation with them about this, and again, this can be an individual that I'm talking to or a big corporation, when I'm communicating about how to properly put together an action plan, there are a variety of things you're going to consider, right? What type of event it might be? You know, is it tend to be a more localized event? Is it going to be a big regional event? 
You know, so that might matter for a corporation or even as an individual, right? Is it going to be a tornado? So even in my area, even if I'm in a tornado watch area, I, I may still be a small percentage of chance that it's going to actually hit me as an individual versus something like a big blizzard coming through or a tropical cyclone or hurricane. So it may dictate a different level of response because not only is the question of how quick is it going to come and go, but how long-lasting are those impacts going to be, at least the parts you can deal with. What kind of response time do you have? Again, very different for a tornado than a hurricane. If you live in Miami and you think you might have to evacuate, right, you're going to have a very different course of action in terms of how far in advance you have to plan than if it is simply responding to a tornado warning. And what do you do in those 10 minutes that you've got between when the warning happens, let's say, and when it gets to you or the two minutes or whatever it is? Different response times. Again, I mentioned how long it's going to last. Then we've got the weather side of it, right? So the forecast lead time. So how far out are you looking? Certainly with a tornado, while you may be kind of heads up something that's three days out, you're not going to be thinking, oh, I need to be ready to jump in the storm cellar tomorrow if it's not for a couple of days out. But on the flip side of that, if there's a big event coming, one of these large-scale events, and that can include some of the things we've talked about before, heat waves even, right? There may be bigger actions you have to take in preparation that are just going to take you more time to get done. So how much time is it giving you? How far out is it looking at you from where you are today to when that event might take place? And the last piece is the probability. How likely is this event going to happen? Now, you may not take all these things. You may want a more simple version, and I understand that. But it could be for key events that could happen to you that you build a little grid. I find it interesting in this day and age, really, that we tend to not jot things down. We, we make little simple notes on a phone or something. But a lot of times it's gibberish, and or it's just it's something that you can't actually work from. So take some time. And I don't, I'm not saying you have to write it down. Put it in your phone. It's a good place for it. Right? One of the things I don't like about phones, though, I don't know, maybe you guys can do it. I cannot. I still, on a, ta a tablet even, I haven't gotten the typing thing down. But at some point, take the time to put together these grids. And again, you can write it and take a picture. That's the other beauty of the phones in this day and age, right? So you can just have it on there. And consider these different things. So you may have, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one that might matter to me, right, here, here in the South. This time, winter's coming in. Ice storms are something we have to think about, and they are very different for us than even thinking about winter weather in general. So if there's a chance, though, of winter weather coming my way, I have to think about certain things at a longer lead time, or I'm better off doing it, let's say, than if I'm rushing at the last minute. We have this kind of joke in the South, and I don't think it's just in the South. Everybody runs the store and gets milk and bread. They, they buy it all out, and wherever you are, it might be different things. I realize everybody's kind of got their go-to products, and it's going to be different for different places around the globe, and I get that. But whatever it is, you'll see that the stores are just, they're empty when these storms come through. And a newer one that's cropped up is like bottled water, which didn't, <laughs> bottled water really wasn't around when I was a kid. So this is kind of a newer area that's, that's popped up, but people think about it. And my recommendation would be to build things in phases. Don't think about an event being a single step. And I'll just give you an example. And then you can start thinking about how to potentially apply this. So I've got a winter storm coming through. And let's say the forecast is seven days out. Now I know, I know that the forecast is a good chance it's going to change. Something might come up and, you know, the temperature may slide one way or the other. Maybe the precip still comes through around the same time. But whatever it is. However, however, if there's a chance of an event, it may say to me, hey, are you, do you have enough bottled water? Like if you had to be a couple days without going to the store, are you prepared? Are you prepared with other things that are easy to buy in advance? Batteries. I was talking about this with my wife yesterday. Coffee is what she said. <laughs> Made me laugh. It's like, what would you do without coffee? But those things that you know that you might need and that you're particularly ones that you're going to use anyways, why not get them in advance? And this can apply to short-term events, like a tornado preparedness kit. Or as you'll see, if you go to the Weather Ready Nation for winter weather, things they recommend to have in the car. A lot of times, not all of it, 
But a lot of this stuff you're going to have anyways or going to make use of anyways. So not, why not take the steps? Maybe you do it as the season approaches. Maybe that's part of what your you know your different grid points are. Is what are, what's what's step A? And then, and like I said, I think with the grid, what you would do is you would have just different letters. Okay, so the probability once it gets to a certain certain point, you may say, okay, that ups it from taking care of A to now moving on to to items in list B, whatever that might be. And for instance, here in the South with freezes, because a lot of times the pipes aren't well protected, making those steps to make sure that I'm thinking about those. And it could be as simple as giving yourself a reminder that when the storm is ready to come through that you take those steps. But if there's things you can do in advance, it's more logical not to get stressed about them in the last minute. But there will always, with these types of events, be things that you can only deal with in the last minute. But trust me, if there's a chance you can lose power and you've got kids and they're going to be home from school, what are you going to do if they don't have access to the Internet and those sort of things, just to keep them entertained? And maybe it's not one of those fun snowstorms. Maybe it is ice and they can't really go out and enjoy it. So it's even thinking through the logic of what would a day look like if, right? And making sure you've thought about some of those things. So fundamentally, the idea is, one, think about the events that can impact you, generally speaking. We can't plan for everything, but some, you know, I'm not going to get um, certain weather that's going to show up in Atlanta. Yes, I can have the after effects of a hurricane or tropical cyclone. I saw that this year. But it's unlikely I'm going to have a Category 5 pounding on my door. So I don't have to plan for it the same way as somebody on the coast. But I do have to think about tornadoes, yet there's a lot of parts of the country that don't. I do have to think about winter weather, but I don't necessarily have to think about unusual lake effect snow weather, all right? because this is not going to happen where I am. And maybe I don't need to think about preparing my house for a level of winter that we just don't generally get in the south. Yeah, there's always a risk, right, as with any of these things, that you need to be cognizant of what's going on around you in case something extremely unusual happens. But many of these things you can plan for. And by having an equation and or, I think more simply, a grid that says, all right, here's the event. They're now forecasting it. That forecast is this far away. I give it that much credibility. I'm going to do step A. When do you get to step B and what does that look like? What's on list B and so on. You have these simple things, and it makes it easier when they come up. And it's also a fun exercise. I don't think this thing has to be complicated. I think it's something interesting you can do. Now, it's not always fun, but depending on the age of your kids, they can learn a little bit more about decision-making processes and what go into them. Yeah, they're not going to want to sit down and do a complicated grid, probably. But you can talk about the things that are important and what they might want to consider because it's a first step for them learning how to evolve that decision-making process and the critical thinking that will serve them well later in life. All right. Now, that's about as much as my voice can handle for this week. I hope you found this interesting. I did try to pick something that was one of my shorter items that I knew wasn't going to take too long. Like I said, if you want to read more about this, this book is interesting, but there are a lot, there are articles and other things as well that, that are out there that discuss it. As we head into the seasonal change, so in the in the north, you know, maybe you're looking at snow in the southern hemisphere, maybe you're looking at the potential for heat waves in Australia or Africa or South America, wherever it might be. Wherever you are, take a little bit of time. I think you'll find it useful to know what your points are. It, it may even be a first step in you understanding a little bit more about your decision process. And how much credibility you put in different pieces of information. And help you kind of talk about some of the things we we went over a few weeks ago about trust. And who do you trust? Because you may not, you you know, your point of, of which forecast, you should probably say which forecast it is. Is that a National Weather Service forecast? Is it a a provider like, you know, weather.com or something like that? Certainly probably not something you see on social media. But it provides that baseline for how we make effective decisions when weather has the potential to have negative or these costs. So again, what you're weighing is the cost versus the potential loss. So if we have the potential to lose, whether it's a life or injury or or physical things, right, 
there's going to be different degrees that we go through. And again, your list A may be, okay, list A, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to have on hand fresh versions of stuff I would buy anyways. So the cost is anticipated, right? You know, rotate some batteries that you would do anyways. Make sure you have fresh ones available. Whereas your things that are out of the ordinary cost, maybe those are step B or C or D or however complicated your process is. I don't know. Just some food for thought. All right. What did I say to do today? What is it about the weather.com slash survey? What is it about the weather.com slash survey? Now, if you don't get to it today, it will be the end of the world. I'm going to mention it for a few more times. And like I said, those of you who are international listeners, I I welcome your feedback as well. You don't necessarily have to answer the Weather Ready Nation specific questions. You can, because you will have heard me mention that before. But what I would tell you, kind of in the middle of the survey, there's there's some questions that have other. If you want to, you can just denote in there on any of them. Just hit other and put international. Or if you want to put the country you're responding from, that's fine too. Because it's interesting to note that if you find value, even though you may not be part of the Weather Ready Nation program, one, you may find the program information useful, but even the way we discuss it on the podcast just in general. All right. I think I've got about another minute before my voice completely says goodbye. I was having a conversation with somebody this week about the word zonal that we use in weather. And they asked me, you know, help clarify for me zonal. I think of zonal like, you know, maybe a zone in a security system in a house or a zone defense in in sports. And it tends to be bound on all sides. That was kind of their thing. And so they didn't really understand for sure what the person was saying. Zonal for us meteorologists just means basically it's latitudinal. So the flow when we're looking at things generally is a long latitude line. So it's not a lot what we call meridional or longitudinal. So you don't get a lot of ups and downs or oscillations, if you will. So if you ever hear somebody say zonal, because I was surprised, the Weather Channel, I don't always hear them say zonal, but I was somewhere where they they did. And then they proceeded to explain what that meant. Because like, okay, so you said it, but then you had to spend just as much time explaining it. But just know, zonal. Particularly in the mid-latitudes and what they were talking about here in the U.S., it was kind of a, we're looking at general flow from west to east. Right. And it does bring different patterns. All right. Thank you for your patience with my voice. What is it about the weather.com slash survey? So until next time, when hopefully my voice will have recovered. And we can get back to where does your weather forecast come from? We're going to hit the next stage of that, I think, next week. Until then, as you're working through your weather equations, your weather grid, or whatever you want to call it, Just remember, as always, there's much more to weather than the weather itself. This is too much to for production. We're tired of hearing our uncle grovel, so please support him on patreon.com slash weather.